proclaim that he is wonderful, but he is mighty, that he is awesome. So just for a moment, church, beyond the music and from the depths of our being, let's turn our hearts and tell the Lord why we're here. Thank you, family. Thank you. Amen. Well, we, I believe, are uh, at an exciting moment uh, in our journey as uh, as a church. I'm excited uh, about what I what I've dubbed believers class, uh, which we started to today. Uh, thanks to uh, to Joseph. And in fact, all the directors and coordinators for their leadership. Uh, during this time, uh, for these 12 weeks, uh, the, the, the sermons, in a, in a sense, uh, will also dovetail with the uh, content of the, of the purple book. And so that means the sermon series for the next 12 weeks uh, is dubbed Believers. Uh, and today's sermon uh, is entitled Sin and Salvation. Uh, Sin and Salvation, which happens to be the section in the, uh, in the Purple Book. Uh, and so it will, uh, it will riff off of um, content of the Purple Book, if you please. Uh, our scripture reading this morning uh, will be the, from the Book of Romans, chapter 6. Uh, we're going to read chapter 6, verse 23. Uh, and I think I just called an audible. So we're also going to read uh, from the book of Ezekiel chapter 4. Uh, and we'll read in there verses 9 through to 15. Uh, but our main scripture this morning is Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. Uh, as has become our custom, let's stand uh, for the reading of Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, and now just for a moment, turning to Ezekiel chapter 4, uh, verses 9 through 15, which is uh, just a supplement to the text this morning. The word says, also take for yourself wheat, barley, beans, lentils, millet, and spelt. Put them into one vessel and make bread of them for yourself. During the number of days that you lie on your side, 390 days you shall eat it. And your food which you eat shall be by weight 20 shekels a day from time to time you shall eat it. You shall also drink by measure one-sixth of a hin from time to time you shall drink. And you shall eat it as barley cakes. And bake it using fuel of human waste in their sight. Then the Lord said, So shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles, where I will drive them. So I said, Ah, oh Lord God, indeed I have never defiled myself from my youth till now. I have never eaten what died of itself or was torn by beasts, nor had abominable flesh ever come into my mouth. Then he said to me, See, I am giving you cow dung instead of human waste, and you shall prepare your bread over it. The word of God, the word of strength. Let us pray. God, speak to us today, this morning, and illuminate your truth in our sight, Lord. We want to hear from you, Lord. And I pray, Lord God, that all things this morning and in the service would work together, Lord, so that those who may not know you yet would know you, and that those who know you would know you more. In your name, amen. 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 You may be seated. Uh, we, uh, as a species, 
has interesting origins. Uh, Genesis 1 highlights these origins and uh, tells us again and again that God created the heavens and the earth, and it was good. Uh, and he made us as part of that creation, and it was good. And yet embedded within that goodness was a unique ability for our forefathers, our ancestors, if you please, uh, to choose. Uh, and in Genesis 3, we experience as part of those origins what is often referred to as the fall. In Genesis 2, God says, You can eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Very clear. You have freedom to eat of all the trees of the garden, but don't eat of this one. And then a serpent came along and said a few words and convinced our, uh, our forefathers and foremothers to eat. And then we hid, we were not hidden from God before, we hid before God. Genesis 3 and 8 and 9 says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. For the Lord called to the man, Where are you? you. God told us, God told humanity not to eat, and we ate anyways. And in that moment, the sin, the separateness entered into part of our story. And yes, there was disobedience in this moment, and there was disobedience that we in some real ways continue to this day. But embedded in that disobedience is this idea of not recognizing who God really is. A God who gives and loves and to ask for us, from us in return for us to choose to love and follow him. And in that moment, we decided not to look to the ways of God and to trust God's word, but instead to say that we should trust God our own understanding and our own ability and that story continues for us to this day and the truth of the matter is as we read in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 among other places that the wages of sin is death that somehow these if, if these moments where we choose our way instead of God's way lead to death. Oh, it feels like a harsh penalty, this idea that sin would cause death. How, how, how can I make this plain? Uh, I used to work at McDonald's, uh, and so I have lots of stories about working at McDonald's. Uh, one of them was the time uh, where I put a hamburger into the, the hopper where the cashiers would grab the food from. Uh, and 10 minutes later, uh, the cashier came out and said, hey, Troy, I ordered a special, a cheeseburger, no cheese. Why isn't it in the bin? Uh, and I said, well, it's a hamburger right there. What's a hamburger? Well, it's a cheeseburger without cheese. I don't know what a hamburger is. Or on my last day, this might be a little embellished, but in the, in, in, in the Saturday evenings, 5 to 6 rush hour, uh, it was just me and halftime of a manager in the back running the entire kitchen. Uh, I like to say that I, I went out on a high note. But one interesting moment uh, at McDonald's, which uh, I wouldn't have said before that I wouldn't forget, but I haven't forgotten it in a few years now, uh, was a time where... The manager came to the back because somebody ordered a Big Mac. Uh, and this person apparently ordered a Big Mac, and there's a certain bun for Big Mac because there's three buns. Uh, and they said, I want a Big Mac, uh, but I can't have any sesame seeds. And so the manager asked me, Troy, can you pick the sesame seeds off of the bun so we can make a Big Mac with no sesame seeds, because there's only one bunny you can use for a Big Mac, and it more details than you want. 
and, and me at the time, maybe I was a little, I don't even know what the word for it is, but I looked and I said, no, I am not doing that. I heard sesame seed, I heard sesame seed allergy, I heard sesame seed allergies like a peanut allergy, and if there is one morsel of sesame on this bun, am I sending this person into shock? And I said, no, 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 remove it far from me. I am not going to try and remove each individual seed from this bun. And in fact, if this person has an allergy to sesame seeds, they might not want to eat here. Now, just my view, but when I make a Big Mac and I make a hamburger with a different type of bun, there might be a little bit of cross-contamination. And if it is the case that a morsel of sesame seed will cause shock and perhaps death, then I don't want to be a part of that, I said. Now, it turns out, if I'm remembering correctly, that I was overreacting and the person just didn't like sesame seeds. <laughs> but I think the point is actually really important because I think there are many ways and many times in our life where we think about sin like sesame seeds. Like we can go into our lives and pick each one off in our own ability and therefore become holy. Something about our world tells us that we can somehow by our own ability, remove all the sesame seeds of sin and be all right. But the truth of the matter is, is that the sesame seeds leave a residue, and they leave a residue beyond what we can see at the molecular level. And if it is true that you need to be pure or holy in order to be okay, then you're not going to be able to move, remove all of the sesame seed and the sesame seed residual. It's just not possible. You cannot, on your own ability, remove yourself from sin. You can try. You might be able to get closer if you think of sins as specific activities. But if we are talking about the categories and you either have a sesame seed list Big Mac or you're in the hospital, you are not going to go to, into McDonald's and pick your sesame seeds off to the point where you are clean. And the truth of the matter is that sin, while we think of it as individual actions, and yes, it is that, it is actually also categorical. You either are sinner or you are not. In the same way as I've heard theologians say, in the same way that you are either pregnant or you are not. There's not really an in-between. There might be measures, but there is no in-between. And now sesame seeds create uh, what I like to call a chasm between us and a God who is holy, a God who is, uh, is righteous, a God who is just, a God who is set apart. And something about this, the, the, the sin nature inside of us, something about the sesame seeds inside us say that we cannot dwell on our own with a God who must be separate from sin. And so we have a problem. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is indeed what we deserve. But the gift of God is eternal life. For by grace are we saved through faith, and not that of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of what we do so we can't boast, but instead because of what God has done. 
God grants us eternal life. Our options are death, separateness from a holy God, or eternal life, reconciliation and communion with a holy God. Those are two options, and indeed they are categorical, and we cannot in our own ability choose eternal life. We couldn't do it, and so we indeed needed a gift, and thanks be to God, God gave us that gift, and we call that gift salvation. Salvation is the opportunity and the privilege to be able to walk in communion with a holy and an awesome God. And I like to imagine it to walk uh, in the garden in the cool of the day with my God. Salvation is the opportunity to live also into the fullness of what we were created for. Because when God said it was good, that goodness rested upon God's being. That goodness rested upon the fact that God sustained us, that God reconciled himself to us, that God was with us. That goodness, that it was good, was because we were together with God. And yes, when you're separate, you can walk around in this world. Yes, there are folks who haven't come to say knowledge of Jesus Christ who can walk in this world, but we were created for more than just to live in this world. We were created to be at one with our God. And to put it into human terms for a moment, uh, I think about what it would look like if Mozart was born in a place where he didn't have a piano, where uh, there were no hammers hitting on strings, where there was no music. That if you argue, and I'm, I'm stylizing this for a moment, that if you argue that Mozart was supposed to be uh, the one who, who could write Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and Blah blah black sheep and uh, A B C D E F G. Uh, if you or if you think that Mozart was the one that was supposed to be able to do that, what would it be or look like for Mozart to never have had a piano, to be separate eternally from a piano and from a purpose? Oh, 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 what if Michael Jordan, yes, Michael Jordan, what if Michael Jordan never had a basketball? What if the game never existed? What if, if, if Tony Morrison never had a pen? Or, or what if Martin Luther King Jr. never had a church to incubate and to protect and to marshal his dream? What if the foundation of our world kept our purpose separate from our possibility? And I want to tell you, in a very real sense, that is our life when we are separated from our God. Mozart walking around. Mozart might, uh, might not be doing so well. Mozart definitely would have been a pauper because I believe he was one anyway. But Mozart never would have created the beautiful symphonies. And we, apart from our God, will never fulfill the fullness of our purpose and commune with the source of our joy. Our separateness from God, if we could look at it from a different perspective, is profoundly sad. It is profoundly problematic. It hurts. It's walking around and striving and never getting. It's seeking but never finding. It's drawing water day after day after day 
but always being thirsty. Church, we were created to commune with our God. Sin gets in the way and there is nothing that we could do to overcome our sin. And the world tells us that we can do it. The world tells us we can pick off sesame seeds. I want you to know that we cannot do it. That we can't do it even if it looks like we can do it. The residue remains. We need to change our category. And for that, we needed a savior. Jesus is that savior. And it's interesting because perhaps the best way to ensure that there's no sesame seeds on our proverbial bun here in a proverbial kitchen, in a proverbial world, is to have somebody who can see and know all of the sesame seeds go in and be the taste tester for us. And for years, that's why kings use taste testers, right? So they go and taste the food, make sure it's okay, and then the king goes and eats it. And yet the king of kings and the lord of lords became, in this analogy, our taste testers, that Christ went and he took on our sin so that we can walk behind him and have fellowship with our God. That's what Jesus Christ did. He took the penalty of our sin so that we could have the opportunity to choose God once again. That's salvation. I want to, just for a moment before I close these thoughts, try and paint a picture of what it meant for Christ to take on our sin. Uh, and for that, for just a moment, we turn to the prophets and specifically the prophet Ezekiel. And I'll preface this by saying uh, that these are in no ways measurable or comparable, but I want to just give uh, this insight into uh, the prophets as a sense of what it means for God to have sent his son to take us in. So the prophets in the Old Testament are asked to do a lot of really difficult things. Often in this day and age, when we think of prophets and prophecy, we think about telling the future. Uh, and indeed, the prophets did a little bit of that. But in my opinion, uh, they more told the truth. Uh, and they were called to embody the truth. So in this example, we didn't read the whole thing. You can read it in Ezekiel 4. But the prophet Ezekiel was called to, in essence, set up a little model of Jerusalem and to set up a siege works, uh, a work to try and topple the city right there, and then to go and lie down in front of this model. And so God asked Ezekiel to go and lie on his left side for 390 days and then to lie on his right side is for 40 days to be a physical embodiment of, uh, of the siege or of the time uh, where, where, where Israel and Judah uh, would be in captivity. Um, and Ezekiel was asked to maintain a very strict diet here. He had a little bit of bread and a little bit of water, and he could only eat and drink at certain times. So uh, tomorrow you may be choosing how you want to fast as you read uh, the, the fast guide, uh, that is for five days. Uh, Ezekiel here was asked uh, to lie down on his side uh, for 430 days, more than a year outside of this little model. So let's ignore for a moment the fact that all of these folks are going to come out and ridicule him and say, hey, Ezekiel, why are you doing this? What's going on? He's going to have to try and explain to them uh, why he's doing this as he's hurting because his side hurts. He's going to have to do all of that. Uh, and let's ignore for the moment the fact that he is going to 
uh, want food and folks are going to be walking by and offering him food all the time and he's going to have to say no because he's only eating at certain times. We're going to ignore that for a moment and just focus on the physical pain of lying on your side for 430 days. This is what Ezekiel was called to do as a sign to the nations and he did it. The prophets were called to other, do other things. We're focusing on Ezekiel for this moment. So Ezekiel, yes, he's a prophet. He is a priest. He is also a man just like you and I are men and women. And he did these things, right? They are very difficult to do. But Ezekiel agreed to do them. And God tells him, mix up a little bit of bread, Ezekiel. Uh, okay, God, I'll do that too. Uh, and God says, okay, to show and to demonstrate how... The people are, are, are defiled. I want you to take the cake that you're going to bake, the bread you're going to bake, and you're going to cook it on human dung. Okay. So Ezekiel was just asked to do all these things. He said yes. Ezekiel was asked right, to cook his bread on, on, on poo. And Ezekiel says, oh, Lord, no! Right? This is where Ezekiel drew the line. He did all of those other things. Ezekiel draws the line here. And why does Ezekiel draw the line here? He draws the line here because he has never defiled himself. He was a priest, holy and set apart. And so the very concept of doing this thing was anathema. Uh, to Ezekiel, and in this case, God relented and said, okay, Ezekiel, you can cook on manure. <laughs> Look at Ezekiel's reaction to doing something outside of holiness. For a man that just agreed to lie inside for 430 days, he would not allow himself to be defiled. Now I want you to think of that human, that Ezekiel, that human who is faulty. And then infinitely multiply that to our God who is not faulty and who is set apart and for whom sin is an and I want you to imagine that God recognizing that there is sin and recognizing that as a just God that sin had to be punished. But also saying that he loves us enough to take the portion of himself through which he created the entire world, the word, and allow it to come and be flesh and walk amongst us. Imagine the fact that God allowed his son to walk through our mess, to in a very real sense walk through our dung so that we might be saved. And I'm saying this this way because I want to, it doesn't even come close, but I want to give a sense of what it cost our God to save us. Or what it cost our God to save us. How much he loved us in order to pay that cost. That God sent his son to go and pick off all our sesame seeds, if you please, and to go through anaphylactic shock on the cross so that we could walk into his truth. He loved us that much, and he sacrificed for us. And he said, yes, I did it for you. And all you have to do is believe that I did it for you and recognize who I am. He did it to give us a new heart and a new spirit so that we could become children of God. 
to make us alive together with Christ, to make us born not of perishable seed, but instead of imperishable. God loved, God sacrificed, he sent his son in a historical reality to live and to die and to suffer and to be defiled with our mess. And God did it so that we could be in right relationship with him, so that you could be free, so that you could be uh, the, the, the proverbial Mozart having a piano, so that you could be uh, Martin Luther King Jr. having the church, so that you could be the Tony Morrison with the pen. Those are, are, are physical examples in a sense, if you please. But I'm talking about the spiritual reality that God has great things for you because he created you for great things when we are with him. And God loved us enough, and God recognized it enough, and God accepted us even when we were in our mess so that we could live into it. Praise God, he did that for us. Uh, as Philippians says, chapter 2, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above all names, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The truth of the matter is that our origin story, as I call it, could have been the end, but instead God chose to make a way. Our choosing our own way instead of God's way, our choosing to see ourselves as God, knowing good and evil, instead of choosing to know that God is our provider and the source of everything else, choosing our own will instead of his will caused us to be separate. But God so loved us that he made a way for us to get back to him from death to eternal life. From death to eternal life. For the wages of sin are death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God gives us the opportunity to live into the possibilities and the realness and the fullness beyond our imagination of life with him. And yes, though everything in this world might try and tell us otherwise, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and the way in which we might live into relationship with God and into the fullness of our being. I praise God because he overcame our problem. I praise God because he sent his salvation. And I praise God because he did it at such a cost. Ah, oh, in my non-Christian imagination of a God. I can't believe that I, God, would do it, would humble himself in this way to sacrifice for us. But I'm so glad about the gospel and the good news that I don't have to walk in my non-Christian imagination of a God, but instead I can taste and see and read and live into the truth that we serve a God that was willing to do that for us, that was willing to sacrifice, that was willing, when we couldn't, to cleanse us at his expense and to make us whole. Praise God for his goodness. Well, the gospel has been preached in your hearing, and I want to just give an opportunity for you to respond to the gospel, to the very truth that we are dead without our God, but that God made a way for us to have life with him. If you haven't accepted that Jesus Christ paid it all on the cross, and ask us simply to acknowledge him through repentance so that he can take on our sins and that we can take on a journey of relationship. 
this is an opportunity to do so publicly. And so now, for a moment, with every head bowed and every eye closed, here in this sanctuary, this beautiful sanctuary at Walker Elementary, Upper Elementary, or online, if you'd like that to be your story, go ahead and slip your hand into the air that we may pray with you. If God is calling you and you haven't accepted yet, this is your opportunity. Online, either now or in the future, if you're making that commitment, please do reach out to us or to another church so that the church, the body of believers, the coming together of folks who have made this commitment can walk with you in your journey. For Victory Church,